Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. On today's video, well, you might notice I have some 64 C's on the bench here. There are a total of five of these machines. They're all broken. Feels like I haven't done any 64 repair videos in quite a while. So let's see if I still remember how to do it and see how many of these things I can get fixed in this video. So without further ado, let's get right to it. Alrighty, so I haven't opened up any of these machines, but I have done some rudimentary troubleshooting by just turning them on. So this one here is a black screen. Uh, this one that I have down here is also black screen. Incidentally, these are all, I think they're all shortboard machines because these have the later cost-reduced keyboard that has the Petsky characters printed on the top side. I must say that these types of machines aren't as common as I think they are outside of North America. By the time the super cost reduced 64 came out, not a lot of people were buying these machines anymore. I think most people had moved on to 16 bit machines at that point. So it doesn't seem like I get a lot of these here in the basement, but I know in Europe, especially like Eastern Europe, these machines were going strong for a good number of years. This one here says bad keyboard CIA issue, can't type. So it could be a bad keyboard or could be a bad CIA, but I obviously had that one powered up and I at least got the basic screen. And then this one that's sitting right here says also bad CIA, no flashing cursor. So that could be a very simple fix as well. And then finally, this last one here says bad power switch. So I guess the power LED didn't seem like it was coming on and I guess um, maybe no video output. So why don't we start with one of the machines that has a black screen. When I do troubleshooting on 64s, my favorite tools are an oscilloscope, the diagnostic cartridge, which includes the dead test cartridge, which is a double-sided cartridge. Of course, you need a reliable power supply, which I have my home-built power supply right there on the bench. And you need a good, reliable way to display the video output. And I'm gonna be using this cable here that goes into my retro tank. Now, before I test out this machine, I always do recommend that you validate that your video display power supply situation is working properly. If you only have one machine, that's a little bit hard to do. Of course, uh, that's not the case down here in the basement. So I'm gonna use this machine here. This is my Ziff 64. If we pop it off here, uh, this does have an FPGA replacement uh, for the VIC-2 chip. I will make a video about that shortly. But for now, I'm just gonna plug this into my power supply and to the video output. So we can take a look at the way it looks. Where did the cable go? There it is. Many times I have tried to troubleshoot computers and I didn't have the connections right or like the video capture device wasn't working correctly. And wow, it certainly seems like <laughs> my machine is having an issue. You can ignore the problem there. Okay, well, I know what's happening here and uh, <laughs> what's happening uh, you see all that, that random text? That is coming from the fact that this CIA right here, the one that handles the keyboard, let me unplug it, move it around in the socket, put it back down. I think the ZIF socket is failing. There we go, the machine is working now. Yeah, it's working properly. Anyways, we're getting a good solid video capture, although it's funny there's black borders, but whatever, we can ignore that. So I know everything is working. Power supply is good, video capture is good. That means we're ready to test the first machine. All right, first things first, let's open this machine up and take a look inside. Oh, it has Torx bits. Yeah, I always forget the 64Cs have Torx bits for the, uh, the case fasteners. Now, I don't know the history of any of these machines, so I don't know if someone's been in here. I'm assuming someone's been in these things. But as I've said many times before, 64Cs are quite reliable. So it's not, they don't generally fail. If you're gonna look for a 64 to buy, I would try to get one of these if you're okay with not having one of the bread bins because it just it seems overall like these things are more reliable. The case is kind of clipped together. You have to pop the clips off on the sides. The fact that this one is quite stuck means that I guess no one's been in this thing. So we have a little bit of corrosion inside and um, oh yeah, this keyboard is screwed down to these mounts. And of course the inside screws besides this uh, dust right there, <laughs> they are Phillips. Now, what's funny about these shortboard machines is I can't easily just go 
tossing out the heat shield or the RF shield like I like to do. And there we go. It's definitely a short board. It only takes up this little bit of space in here. Both motherboard types do fit in here. But the problem is, is these brackets here are required to hold the keyboard up. Now you can 3D print replacements. So if you want to install a long board into here, like say one from a bread bin, you have to print some new brackets. And these are attached. They're actually like riveted on to this shield here as well. So I can't even just toss the shield out very easily, which is kind of a bummer. What I have done in the past, people are going to probably criticize me for this, but I've actually like cut away part of the shield right here so I could install the brackets again, use the metal ones and ditch the rest of this. Cause I just don't like this, the cover that this covers up the motherboard. I feel that like it hinders the already bad ventilation that you have inside a 64. Now I'm gonna say that this machine is probably untouched or if it was touched, it was touched a very long time ago because um, well, it all looks like it's pretty unmolested don't see a lot of fingerprints and things in here. There we go. Uh, funny that this has a little trap door, so to speak. <laughs> don't know what that's all about. You can obviously remove that if you want more ventilation there. <laughs> so it does have these little tongs or prongs or whatever you want to call them that like touch the various chips. And you see the white thermal paste there. It doesn't really do that much. I suppose it has a little bit of a heat sinking thing, but really minimal, especially after this long, that is all crusty and uh, it's no longer, no longer particularly effective any longer. All right, so the motherboard should pop out. There is the bottom part of the shield. We're gonna leave that out, pop the board there. We'll just get a little bit of the lay of the land here. So this is the PLA, this large IC here. This is the DRAM 64K, it's made by Sharp. This is the older of the two versions of this motherboard. The PLA here has external character or color RAM, that is. That's this I see right here. The later ones actually integrated that right inside the PLA. So if you do have one of these machines and you need to order a replacement PLA for some reason, make sure you order the correct type. Because if you order the one like this that has the external color RAM, it's not going to work on your board if the board doesn't have the footprint for the color RAM. But that's really only for the much later versions of the short board. This one appears to be from maybe 1988 or so. I think they were making these short boards all the way up into the early 90s until Commodore folded, basically. And it was those later ones that had the uh, integrated color RAM here. There's a little bit of corrosion on the board just in the corner here, but it, that RF shield had a little bit of rust on it as well. So it might be related to that. And the back of the board, yeah, this looks pretty much pristine. I don't see any evidence of rework. If anyone did rework on this thing, they cleaned up their work very well afterwards. Yeah, this unmolested pretty much this board. Alrighty, so the note I had on there, because I had done some pre-testing, turn the power switch off, um, was that it has a black screen. Let's just validate that that is absolutely the case by powering this up. Oh, I have it in the wrong mode again. There it is. In fact, we don't even see that line that's on the left side. I think that that's a setting in here. I'm just going to quickly hook up my other 64. I just want to get these settings aligned properly so I can see that white line. I rely on that white line to be visible to help me in my troubleshooting. So on my ZIF 64, I'm just putting the original VIC-2 chip back in there. Okay, there we go. I'm happy with those settings now. The picture's also filling up the whole picture. So yeah, we're getting the white line. If we turn it on, there you see the white line, and then the picture shows up. Normally I keep that stuff cropped off, actually, if I'm just normally using a 64, because you don't need to see that. But that white line is a good indicator, actually, because if your VIC-2 chip is working, then you're going to have that white line. If the VIC-2 chip is dead, for instance, or not working at all, then that white line will not be visible when you first power the machine up. So if we go back to this motherboard here, the one we were just testing, and we plug this black in, we're going to see the white line. I know that's going to show up because uh, there it is. Now, the fact that it's sort of black is okay, or gray there, that's the auto leveling or whatever on the retro tank. This particular one, see how it's fading away. That is not a problem on this particular board. Alrighty, cool. So we have obviously a working VIC-2, we have a working clock. If the clock generator, which is this I see right here that I have my finger on, were not working, I can demonstrate by just popping it off the board. It's in a socket. If this chip were bad, well, you're gonna get a black screen, but you're gonna get nothing. In fact, we have no picture at all. So the machine is on right now, but there's no image even, it's not even locking onto an image. If you had a CRT, you would just see a black screen. 
This is necessary for all the clocks to work on the machine. The IC is an 8701, and what this does is it takes the clock, which is right here on the motherboard, and it divides it up and does what's necessary to then go into the VIC-2 chip, which is then what generates all the clocks for the video, of course, and generates the video signal, but also runs the CPU and stuff like that. So you need this chip to be working, but you can kind of tell when it doesn't, because like I said, the computer doesn't really do anything at all. So I pop that back in the board, and we turn this back on, and there we go. We're back to where we were before with the white line, but the black screen otherwise. All right, first things first, typical problems with these machines. Well, black screen can unfortunately be caused by all sorts of issues. But one of the things that typically goes wrong is the DRAM goes bad. And I gotta say, the DRAM on this machine is now getting very, very hot. So with that said, I'm gonna say that these two sharp DRAM chips, uh, their 4464s, are bad. Now, just for fun, let's plug in the dead test cartridge here. Dead test. I have a feeling it's not gonna do anything because what happens when the DRAM goes bad like this is it just basically kills the data bus. So let's plug the video back in, turn this on. All right, we're actually getting flashing, so it didn't kill the data bus entirely. But the DRAM is really, really hot, and this DRAM on these later machines shouldn't even get warm. In fact, like these other chips, none of them are warm except for the DRAM. Anyways, the flashing there definitely indicates a RAM problem. But the fact that they're hot, if you turn your machine on and they're hot, you just might as well just swap them out. Okay, sockets are installed. I put some DRAM chips in there that I think work, I think. Let's plug this in and see what happens. Okay, look at that, we have a working system. All right, great. I'm gonna turn down the chroma decoding here on the retro tank. I am not super happy with the 5X. This was a donation, thank you very much, uh, Seth, for saying that in, but it's, it's problematic. It just does weird stuff. Like, why did I have to turn the chroma way down on this particular board? I don't know. The, the other one didn't seem to be as finicky as this. Either way, uh, we have a flashing cursor. We have RAM that's not burning hot. Test harness is connected, and I have the diagnostic cartridge in here. Power this up. I'm predicting that this thing is going to work without any issues. I do not have the audio connected, so that is one thing we're not going to be able to hear. But the SID chips on these are also super reliable, and we will do the dance party <laughs> once this works. I think we're good, and just the last interrupt test. Okay, there we go, it's doing the sound test. I have the Easy Flash 3 cartridge in here in my new pink case, thank you very much Sloopy for that. I have the audio connected up to the speakers as well, plus I plugged in the keyboard that was from uh, the case that I just took out. Turn on the system, and we go to Adrian's Tools, 8-Bit Dance Party, here we go. All right, so uh, yeah, that sounds absolutely normal. The uh, the SIDs on these later machines sound a bit different than the ones on the bread bins, but that's just par for the course. And it sounds absolutely normal. This machine is now 100% working. The keyboard is even working properly. So that's it, on to the next machine. All right, machine number two. This one is the one that says, bad CIA can't type. Why don't we crack this open and then see what's actually the problem. Well, this one is uh, <laughs> pretty dirty inside. Could well be a keyboard problem that's, uh, that's wrong with this thing. Like maybe it's just filthy inside the keyboard and that's keeping it from actually working. As you can see though, this is gonna be a short board just like the last one. When I'm loosening these screws though, there's a little bit of a crack sound. Well, at least there was on that one, which kind of implies to me at least that no one's been in this machine either. Alrighty, all the screws are out. Oh, look at the color of the PCB. It's green as opposed to the yellow on the last one. All right, so what do we see on this one? Well, external color RAM, just like the last one. But on the back side, well, it looks like 
completely untouched except for, well, you know, this is just hand soldered this stuff anyways, which is why there's flux residue. All of this was wave soldered and cleaned after it was installed. So everything looks, well, pretty good actually. As is typical for these short boards, everything is soldered in except the CPU, the SID chip, and the uh, VIC-2, along with the clock synthesizer, whatever chip that, I don't know what that's, 8701, whatever that thing's called. Let's plug in the power, let's plug in the video, and let's see what happens when we turn this on. Okay, we're getting a flashing cursor. Kind of implies that this thing is actually gonna work. So we're gonna plug in the diagnostic ROM here and the test harness. I am just gonna give the uh, contacts a little bit of a clean again because that looks pretty gross. Oh yeah, that's dirty. Now, if we do test this thing and it tests good, that means that the keyboard is the problem. And I wouldn't be surprised, judging by how filthy this is, that maybe I couldn't type anything because uh, all the, the inside the keyboard is just dirty. Let's see how this tests. Obviously, the RAM is good. And uh, unlike the last one, the RAM here, which is working when I'm touching it here, it's not even hot at all. Uh, so far, so good. Keyboard, it says it's open and the control port is bad. Okay. So we definitely have a fault on this machine. Sound test. Okay, I just had the speaker down, so that's working. Okay, so it's saying that the 6581 is bad. That's the SID for the um, paddle ports. It's not even, it just thinks that the keyboard is open. Let me just double check. This is definitely connected the right way. Plug that back in. All right, same problem. Control port open and the keyboard open. All right, first thing we're gonna do is jump into the schematics. Now think about the two problems that we're seeing. We're seeing that the keyboard's not working and I can guarantee, remember from my original note, that when you power this up without diagnostic cartridge, you can't actually type anything on the keyboard. Even though the cursor's flashing, it doesn't actually sense anything as you type. And of course, the diagnostic also says the keyboard is open. But we also have to think about the other problem. The diagnostic cartridge is saying that the SID is bad and that's because the SIDs handle the paddle inputs, the analog inputs. Now take a look at the schematics here. So here's the keyboard connector. There's the 6526 that handles that particular keyboard. And if we look at the joystick controller ports, you notice here pot A or pot B, these are the potentiometers or the analog inputs that are for the paddles. Well, they make their way up to this chip right here, U11, a 4066. It's sort of like a, an analog switch device, you can think of it that way. Notice that the potentiometer inputs go to this. This would be from the paddles. And then those are just connected up to two single outputs that then make their way over to the SID chip. Now we may be dealing with two separate problems here. These two issues may be completely unrelated, but I'm kind of thinking that they're gonna be related because obviously we can see on this 4066, these two systems are interconnected. Now there are two column connections that make their way up to this 4066. And well, those are just two column things those shouldn't necessarily break the entire keyboard from working. Now that I think about it, let's hook up a known good keyboard, the one from my Ziv 64 up to this machine. And let's just validate for sure what the keyboard is doing. We can also try booting up into a joystick tester because you notice here are these joystick inputs. Notice these also go to the same 6526. And yes, using the joystick ports uses the same signals on the 6526, meaning they actually conflict with each other. You can't use the joystick and the keyboard the same door you can. But if you push a key and you move the joystick, they can actually interfere with each other. So let's try to figure out, do the digital joystick inputs work? Does the keyboard work at all, as in any keys? And I don't have a way to test the paddles right now, but we can be sure that that's probably not working because of the diagnostic test, which does test the paddles. I'm thinking that maybe these two signals here coming from the 4266 are causing a problem on the entire system. Like maybe the diagnostic test can't run because perhaps this 4066 has gone bad and it's holding six and seven high or low or something like that. So let's get this all hooked up and we'll use these telescope as well to kind of see what we can see going on with this machine. All right, so the system is booted up and I have my 64 keyboard from my uh, Ziff machine, which I know is a good keyboard so i'll plug that in and let's see do we have any keyboard activity on any key oh okay we're getting some and we're getting some strange stuff in fact i'm getting q all the time on that row all right so we're getting some kind of activity it's not behaving as i would expect 
but something is happening. So I have the ZIF64 on the bench because we have a known working computer. And the first thing I wanted to do is show the way the signals look on the keyboard connector when you don't have a keyboard connected. So notice here we have rows and columns. And what the 64 does, and I think I'm getting this correct, is it sends pulses over the column signals and they are all happening not at the same time as each other. So column zero is pulsing like at this rate we can see right here on the oscilloscope. And, oh, okay, the program just crashed. Um, the virtual bench, this National Instruments virtual bench is honestly a piece of junk. <laughs> I have really struggled with this thing lately. What happens is occasionally when you zoom in and out, and I don't know what the rhyme or reason is, it will just crash. And it's not doing it right now, but it just does it periodically. And I'll, it gives you this runtime error. And then basically the program just quits. And I have to relaunch it again. And anything I had set up on there is gone. Anyhow, back to what I was talking about. So the 64 instructs the 6526 to pulse each of these column outputs. And then it reads at the same time it's pulsing these outputs, it reads the row inputs. And when you're holding down a key on the keyboard, a key connects one of the rows and one of the columns together. That's what the key push actually does. What happens is the 64 sends out a pulse on one of the columns and you hold down a key that connects it to say row zero. Well, on row zero, the 6526, which is this PB zero line is gonna be seeing that pulse coming through. If you're not pushing any key, then no pulses are gonna come through. So when we go back to the other machine, we're gonna to expect to actually see those pulses happening on these column pins. They're happening on all of these pins. If we just touch the random ones, you know, you see it on all of them. Now, if you go to the row pins themselves, you're not gonna see anything. Those are gonna look high, just sitting here idle. But when you connect the key through, remember it pulls it down to ground and that's how the 6526 tells could tell you pushing one of the keys. Now, since we know that column zero through seven should be sending those pulses out, those pulses should make their way to the 4066 as well. And I have a feeling those are needed for that potentiometer or those analog inputs functionality to work properly. So let's go back to the other machine. Let's see if we're seeing those normal pulses uh, coming through on those pins, because I kind of have a feeling that we're not going to see those. And that is going to tell us right there that there's probably a problem with the 6526, which is this chip right here. All right, so this machine is on. The column pins are these ones up at the top here. It starts at pin 20 for column seven. And we go on that pin and look at that. It's just low. So uh, see about these other ones. Yep, they're all low. So that's kind of telling me, let's look at the row input pins. Those are high. So I think what's going on when we were pushing keys and we were seeing something, I think all of these outputs here, PA through seven are stuck low. And when I was pushing on keys, I think the pulling, the kernel pulls these PB lines right here looking for key presses. It probably starts at row zero. And when I push a key, it does ground that input pin, of course, because those column pins are all stuck down at ground, which probably causes the machine to register a key press just because it is correlating a low input on one of those pins there when I push the key. The problem is, those signals are always low. They're not pulsing like they should. So it's not gonna push the right keys. And that's sure enough, that's exactly what we were seeing. Just seeing junk input. Now, originally I was thinking that maybe the 4066 were bad and it were holding down these two pins. That would be six and seven. But we're seeing at the oscilloscope, I saw all of the column pins stuck at ground. Now these pins that go over to the joystick port, you know, it's possible there's something wrong at this part of the board and that was holding those pins low but we can see right here that there is nothing connected to pin 15. It doesn't have the joystick or this 4066 connected. And let me just double check that that pin is low as well. And there we are, I'm on pin 15 on the connector. And as you can see, that is just stuck low all the time. Now it's kind of unusual. And if we go back to the diagnostic cartridge, I have the computer turned off right now. And we boot up to the diagnostic cartridge. I can tell right here, that the 6526 is working to some extent, like it's communicating to the rest of the computer. And that's because you see these two clocks right here, one that says 24 a.m. and 24 p.m. These are the time of day functions that are in each of the 6526s. There are two 6526s on the board, one that handles the user port and some stuff over here. And this one here is handling the keyboard and joystick ports. Well, the times are counting up there. If the 6526 were removed from the system or totally dead, for instance, 
you wouldn't have a valid time showing up there. So that's a really good way to tell that the 6526 is communicating on the bus and each one of these clocks is for each one of these. Anyhow, I think we figured out pretty much for sure that the problem on this machine is the 6526 has gone bad. And incidentally, it's not warm or anything. So that really sucks that it's bad. And by the way, I keep calling it a 6526. It does say that on here. I think sometimes these are labeled 8521, maybe something like that on the 64C but both of them are the same part. They just changed the part number for the 65C. They're 100% interchangeable with each other. But please do remember that if your keyboard's working for the most part, but you have no paddle inputs, like the analog input for the SID is bad, then the 4066, which is this chip right here, can also be bad. So just try to remember that. And you can see that on the schematic, how that thing is wired in. But we should be seeing pulsing coming from the 6526. And we're not so I'm gonna remove this and then I'll put a socket in and let's see if that fixes the problem. Alrighty, so the socket is in. I've grabbed the 6526 from my Ziff machine, even though it was messing up at the beginning of this video, that's the socket that's in there. It's not this chip. I don't think it's that chip at least. The original chip is right here. It's out of the board. It's uh, not damaged or anything like that. So um, if it's actually okay still, and there's some other problem on this board, it's technically possible then we can go back to this other one. Now, I wanted to mention one thing about this as well, is if the PLA had a problem and it weren't selecting the 6526, because the PLA is required to select that chip, then that could cause it not to work as well. I didn't actually go ahead and check the chip select line that was coming from the PLA. And the reason why I didn't is because in the diagnostic ROM, when we had that running, we were seeing that timestamp updating properly. That showed me that the diagnostic ROM was communicating properly to the 6526, which would not happen if it were a problem with the PLA selecting that chip. Say the read-write signal wasn't getting to the 6526, then you also wouldn't have that timestamp counting down. Well, I don't think you would at least. So yeah, let's plug this one in. I need to crimp the pins on here. This little 3D printed tool that someone sent me in, sent in. <laughs> This one was not desoldered off another board. Make sure this is off, and it is. And that is a pretty stiff socket, but there we go. It is in there now. With the computer turned on, we have a flashing cursor. I have the keyboard that matches this computer. Came with the case, it's very dirty. Plug that in. It's fully working now. So that tells us right there that that, unfortunately, was a bad 6526. The reason why I say unfortunately is you can't get those anymore. Um, they haven't been made in a long time. And you know, as far as FPGA replacements go for the 64, <laughs> yeah, uh, there isn't yet one. I think there's one that's ready to come out. It's like in beta testing. I have no idea how much it's gonna cost. It's a cute little circuit board that fits in the footprint of this and will plug into the board. But this is a pretty complicated chip. There's a lot going on on here when it has all these different timers and inputs and outputs on there, plus those time of day functions. And there's all sorts of things this chip is good for. It's a pretty complex chip, so it's not simple to replicate. And you might be thinking, why can't I use a 6522 from a VIC-20, for instance, or a 6520 as well? Those are kind of similar chips to this. Well, they just don't do nearly as much as this chip can do, and they are not compatible. You can't just put them in. It's not register compatible. So you have to use a 6526, which are hard to find, and they're kind of expensive at this point. While we have this connected up, I plug the oscilloscope probe onto the keyboard connector and take a look at that. There are those um, pulses that we're expecting to see, and they're on all the various pins here. Oops, I'm not making a good connection there. But yeah, there we go. So you wouldn't have a working keyboard without those. It's not possible. So not seeing those pretty much confirmed immediately that there was something going on with the 6526. And of course, if it wasn't being seen in the diagnostic ROM, then maybe there was a problem with the PLA or something like that, but it was being seen, which definitely points to the chip itself being bad. So I have the diagnostic harness connected back up. Let's power this up and we should see everything good now. I don't think there's gonna be any problem unless the SID is bad, which I find that highly unlikely that it is. And it's probably only gonna be a problem with the 6526 as the only fault with this machine. Look at that, everything shows okay now. And let's just wait, there, there's the sound test, that's working. So boom, bad 6526 as the only fault in this machine. 
That brings our total bad parts down to these two RAM chips here and this 6526. So for two machines, I'm just gonna draw an X on this. So we know where that goes and do we have time for one more machine? Yes, I think let's do that. I'm gonna grab another machine and we'll do three on this episode. All right, the next machine, boy, this bench is getting messy here. Next one is a black screen machine. So this may well just be bad RAM again. And if that's the case, I'll breeze through and get this thing working and we'll move on to the other one that has, um, I don't know, I think it said no flashing cursor, which unfortunately no flashing cursor could just be another bad, a bad CIA 6526. Hopefully that's not the case because we kind of want something a little more interesting than that. But well, like I said at the beginning of this video, these types of C64s are just reliable machines. They're just reliable. This one doesn't look as corroded on the inside, so that's kind of nice. It's definitely way less dirty than the other one. Pop out the keyboard. It's all pretty easy. I've done this multiple times now. One thing that's interesting is the screws that hold down the shield are Torx. And on so far, all the other ones, I think everyone I've ever worked on, to be honest, are actually um, Phillips. And the keyboard screws, the two screws for the keyboard were Phillips, but they're different. The ones that go into the case here have a, like a plastic thread, sort of like the ones that are on the underside. And the ones that are for the keyboard go into the, the metal brackets here, so those are machine screws. So they have a much thinner thread. But I think everyone knows when Commodore was assembling computers, they just sort of randomly threw them together. So, you know, you kind of can't, you can't expect everything to be done the same way. You know, maybe this is a much newer computer. Let's see when we pop this off. A little screw fell out there. No, this looks like the same exact motherboard type as the other one. So we have the external color RAM. So this is not like a later version. And I don't know, everything's looking run of the mill in here. So let's just plug this in and validate for sure that we're just seeing that same old black screen. And then I'm just going to finger the two chips here. They are different brands. So uh, if they have gone bad, well, you know, I guess it's not brand specific at least. Oh, it's already on. The power switch was actually on. Oh, those are hot. Yeah, okay. Another bad, more bad RAM. All right, well, I'm just gonna jump cut, repair the RAM, and let's see if that fixes it. All right, it was quick for you, but new RAM chips are in. Uh, the old ones are sitting right here. I have not turned this on, but as you can see, I have the diagnostic test harness connected. So let's turn it on together. Will we see the test screen? Oh, I need to plug the diagnostic cartridge in as well. Let's get that in there. Okay, here it is. Will we see the test screen? Look, there it is, came right up instantly. So uh, definitely, unless something else comes up, this was bad RAM. Uh, we can see that there are good timestamps there. So the two 6526s are good. And let's uh, turn up the speakers here so I can hear the SID tune, but yeah, that's that's a boring fix. So, so far, three machines, two have had bad RAM and the RAM just got hot. This RAM, by the way, got really, really hot, like quickly. The other one, a little bit less so. And then we have the bad 6526. Let's see. Oh, I forgot to plug the keyboard in. I'm just gonna plug the keyboard in and we will let this run again just to double check that everything is working on this machine. While this runs, I'm just gonna put a couple X's on here. I know people like to see that and I don't always remember to do it. I definitely always do it because I do not, I repeat, I do not want to get bad chips mixed in with my chips that are probably good. So those are X's, uh, we're sticking them in there for now. Um, here we are back on the diagnostic screen and I'm sure the keyboard's gonna be fine. So this machine, it's like super clean, keyboard okay, everything is okay. This thing just freaking works. Bad freaking RAM. All right, next up, this one I wrote bad CIA, no flashing cursor. So I just assumed the CIA was bad because the cursor wasn't flashing and that typically happens Pretty sure that happens with the one, if the CIA on the keyboard, the one we've already changed once, is bad, like completely bad, then you don't get a flashing cursor at all. So let's open this up. Maybe it's missing, maybe someone stole it. 
Uh, this machine's in really, really good shape. Looks very, very clean. I don't even see any yellowing. Aha, look at that. This is a longboard machine. So let's uh, get this out of here. Fortunately, the power connector for the LED is under the keyboard, so you can't easily disconnect that. Not until you've got the keyboard out of here. So longboard, uh, this is exactly the same motherboard that was in my field found 64C. So it's a typical longboard, almost always it's a typical longboard, but the difference is instead of eight RAM chips, it's got two. So it looks like a normal longboard. They just did a little consolidation where they switched to using the 4464 RAM chips. So the LED connects under there. And let's get this keyboard out of here. And this is what I was talking about. So these brackets right here are what hold the keyboard up and they're a little different and they are held in with Torx screws as is the rest of the motherboard. Now my field found 64, that was the one I found in a field. Well, a farmer found it in a field and then gave it to me. <laughs> Thing was rusted out, it was full of ants and everything inside. That machine didn't have the RF shields anymore. They were completely gone, 100% rusted away to nothing basically. So I did have to 3D print the brackets, which at some point in the future, if I recall, someone sent me some metal brackets to replace the 3D printed ones. But honestly, the 3D printed ones work perfectly well. And the nice thing about them is they allow you to take away this yeah, RF shield entirely, which can definitely um, help things out from an airflow perspective. These motherboards don't have the later low power chips that the short boards do. They're not the 8,000 series chips, they're just the normal 6,000 series chips. And things like the SID and the VIC-2, they get much hotter. So when you have them on a, under a shield like this, well, that can, uh, I don't know if it causes premature heat death, but it certainly causes the chips to get very warm. All right, so let's take a look at this. Uh, how do we get this out? Why is this stuck in? What happens is the RF shield that's welded onto the board there, or soldered onto the board, it gets kind of stuck, there we go. It gets kind of stuck on these little standoffs here. And that's because we see right there, it's got the little um, hole punched out. Well, that falls into there. And normally you could just slide the board out. The short boards, they're not actually soldered onto the bottom RF shield. That stays in the case. Um, notice by the way, that this does have the standoffs for both types of motherboards. Now the bread bin cases in Europe also have standoffs for both sizes. So you can put short boards into the bread bin cases as well. Bread bins in North America though, don't have these set of standoffs right here. They only have the ones that accommodate the larger motherboards like this one. There's an adapter plate. It's a RF shield that goes underneath short boards. If they were to go into a North American bread bin case, VIC-20s use that because later VIC-20 boards are the same size as the uh, as the later short boards. Okay, so um, just as I said, this has got the two RAM chips instead of the eight that are in the later boards. There's a little bit of simplification because of that, but generally everything else on the motherboard is exactly the same. Now, of course, this is the later design that has, um, well, the clock circuitry is all consolidated into the 8701, just like on the later short boards. But otherwise, yeah, this thing is just a bog standard normal long board. It's pretty reliable because it seems like by the time these were getting made, if I could find my magnifiers, I wouldn't be surprised if this is like 86 or so, 87 on those chips, 87 there, 87 on this chip, and this is 86. So because there's stuff that's soldered down that's from 1987, we can assume that, like I said, this thing was at the very end of the line. Now, I don't remember really pointing out the date codes on those previous short boards that we looked at, but I think they were, there was an 89 and there was maybe an 88 or something like that. And um, I don't think there was any from the 90 so far. Although to be honest, I wasn't paying that close attention. And I'm sure people watching this video probably noticed the date stamps on those. Let's just plug this in and actually do a test. Let's see how the keyboard is behaving. As I mentioned that there was no actual flashing cursor. All right, and there we are, the system booted up. So we have the basic prompt and we have no flashing cursor. I'm gonna stick this diagnostic ROM cartridge in. Let's take a look and see if we see that uh, timestamp thing. So there it is, right there, timestamp, 4422D. Notice that is completely wrong. That implies right away that this particular chip right here is no good. The other one on the other hand, which uh, does disk drives and stuff like that is, so that's unfortunate. 
That's really unfortunate. Now, from what I've heard in the past, remember the joystick ports are connected to the keyboard input. We saw that on the schematic for the short board, but it's the same on this board. There's possibility that some maybe some static charge or something went into these ports and did damage this chip. That is certainly possible. I've heard that throughout the years that it was. I've never witnessed that myself, but it doesn't mean it doesn't happen. And I think people can probably attest to that, that they were you know, handling their 64 and they went to plug a joystick in and they zapped the joystick port with their finger as they were going to plug it in. And then the machine didn't work after that, or like they couldn't use the keyboard or mouse anymore or mouse. But the good indicator that there was a problem with the CIA was just simply the fact that the cursor wasn't flashing and it's required for the whole timer circuit to work that allows the cursor to flash. All right, so I think at this point, this machine may be a boring fix. So I'm just gonna jump cut to having a socket in here and we'll see what happens. And I was thinking when I was about to take the 6526 out, don't, I forgot to check what I said you need to check, which is the chip select line. And this being an older machine has the more unreliable PLA in it. Now this being a later of these uh, machines, the PLA started to get pretty reliable, the, even the one that this thing uses by this point, what, 1987, but it still could be bad. So we need to make sure that the 6526, I think this is it right here, U1, has the correct chip select line. Now there it is, it's pin 23. Now if we scroll back down here, there it is, CIA2 and CIA1. Those are the signals that come from the PLA that turn on or chip select the actual 6526s. Now the normal failure mode for the PLA on this, like the crappier PLAs, is that it goes low on the outputs. Now low, turns on the chip select to whatever it's connected to all the time. So it would have the effect of causing a black screen on this machine if the chip select line that was going to this was always low because that, that CIA chip would be selected all the time and it would basically cause a bus conflict. Now, if these were socketed, a really easy thing to do would just be take them out, swap them around, and then see if you could then start to type and you get your keyboard back. But we don't have that because these are not socketed right now. So let's use the oscilloscope Take a look at pin 23. Uh, I'm gonna turn this on and we should see some activity on there and a, at a good looking signal. One, two, three. Let's zoom out a little bit. That doesn't look like we have any activity whatsoever on here. Let's look at the other one. One, two, three. Okay, so there we go. That's normal triggering of the other one. This is not the one that controls the keyboard. Let's go over to the keyboard one. And I'm going to power cycle the computer. That's normal activity right there. And clearly we're not getting that flashing. Well, this is ruling out that the PLA is the problem. If we saw zero activity and it was just high all the time, that would kind of confirm to me that the PLA on this machine maybe were bad. But as I mentioned, the normal PLA mode on these types of long boards is the outputs get held low. And I've definitely shown that on videos before. And when they're held low, you absolutely get a black screen because that would keep this chip enabled all the time, which would definitely cause a bus conflict, which would keep this computer from starting up. So I'm gonna socket this 6526. And let's see if that fixes the machine. Jump cut. Okay, well, um, I was getting this chip out and I don't know if this is showing up in the video footage, but it looks like one of the pins is completely detached. Uh, this one right here, I haven't done anything on the top side, but it looks like it had a blowout or something. Uh, I think it is still connected, but it definitely looks sort of burned right there. All right, there's the chip, it's out. Definitely something funny going on there. It's hard to get the camera to focus on it, but it's almost like it melted around that pin there. You see that? That doesn't look good. Oh yeah, down there too. And that wasn't the removal process that I was doing. Absolutely not. I didn't uh, touch the top side, except for just a little bit of hot air. I don't think there's any kind of damage here though. I'll just clean that off with a little IPA. Yeah, the trace is definitely still connected, but just strange. And here we are on the back side of the board and there's absolutely no kind of um, evidence of damage or anything. It looks like I gotta empty that hole there. Oh yeah, it looks a little clogged up. There we go, that's cleaned out. But yeah, whatever damage happened to that chip didn't come from the back side of the board, came from something on the top side. And I'm going to say 
that it definitely appears that no one has ever been inside this computer. But that to me doesn't seem, that doesn't seem right. Okay, the new socket is installed and I have the 6526 from the Ziff machine in here. All the test harness is connected. Diagnostic cartridge is in the machine. Let's turn this on and see if the machine is working. All right, right off the bat, we have <laughs> good clocks down there in the bottom right corner. So I have a feeling this thing is gonna be working. I can hear a little bit of buzz coming out of the SID chip. Make sure the volume is turned up here. All right, here we go. Everything is testing good. Let's just hear those SID tones. Okay, yes, sounds totally fine. All right, well, <laughs> that was it. This computer is fixed. And all we're left with is this strangely burned, oh, I'm putting my hand on the, the Vic chip there, getting that stuff on there, the strangely burned pin on here. Well, I'm just gonna get my marker and we'll put an X on here. So that brings our bad part count up to what? Um, two RAM chips, another two RAM chips, and now two 6526s. The RAM chips are easy to find replacements for, but Mm, those are not easy to find replacements of. All right, we have the last 64C. This one I wrote bad power switch. And besides the fact that I think it doesn't turn on, the power switch, when you actually manipulate it, it doesn't even feel like it's working. Like I don't hear the normal click. So I have a feeling it's broken inside there and well, maybe it's fixable. So you know the drill, it's time to open this up and well, would you look at that? That's something I haven't seen before. Warranty seal. <laughs> I don't think I've ever seen a 64 or 64C with a warranty seal like that. And made in China. You know what? Let's look at one of these other machines here. Where are these ones made? Made in USA. And um, I think they all kind of have this same yellow sticker on the back here. Yep, that's a USA machine as well, as is this one. And then the first one is also USA as well. Well, I have to say that's kind of intriguing. Not so much that the sticker says made in China, but a warranty sticker. Phillips screws as well, not the usual Torx. Well, I'm gonna have to break the seal because clearly this machine is not gonna work. Ooh, these screws are in really tight as well. Made a little crack sound. But yeah, the machine is not gonna work. So warranty is void. Oh no. So I'm wondering if this is like a really late model, maybe something that's got the integrated color RAM perhaps. Oh yeah, the shield looks different here. I think it does. Uh, it doesn't have the little trap door there for the CPU. Alrighty, keyboard removed dirty inside, but you know, such is life for an old Commodore 64. With the shield removed, exactly like I thought, it does not have a color RAM chip. So this is one of the later models. Very interesting. It's the very first time I've seen one of these here in North America. I've definitely seen these as boards that were sent in from viewers from overseas. I've just never seen one actually here. Also take a look at this. This barcode sticker, that's something I can't say I've ever seen on a 64. And we know this thing has never been opened because of the warranty sticker. And there is one on the back edge of the case right here as well. And I'm pretty sure that I've seen these same stickers on Amigas. Anyways, looks like the date code on these ICs is from around 1991. So uh, yeah, we're kind of late in the game. And well, that's interesting. How could this thing that have never been opened have a broken capacitor. That's just unusual. I wonder if it was like that from when it was new. I don't see how an impact could even cause that. This machine doesn't have any damage or anything on here. The case is in really, really good shape. Any kind of damage would have been very obvious. So that's a bit weird. I'll have to fix that, I guess. Okay, first things first, power switch. It's not even clicking. I don't know, maybe that is okay. Best thing to do, of course, is get out the multimeter, check for continuity. So these two pins should have continuity while it's off. And the same thing on this side, and it does. 
And then these two pins here won't have any continuity while it's off and you just turn it on and that should gain continuity. And it does now. So uh, I guess the switch is not broken. Yeah, this switch appears to be working properly. I don't know why it doesn't feel clicky. But there's no continuity there now. And there is there. Okay, switch is good. Other things to check, the fuse. Well, that's good, so no problems there. That cap is clearly bad, but we can try turning it on uh, without the cap in place. Uh, you know what, let me just remove that cap and we'll swap it out. So here's the old cap, 470 microfarad at 35 volts. Definitely had leaked a little bit, uh, the one leg that was still in the board. I'm gonna install this cap here, 330 at 50. I couldn't find, uh, <laughs> I couldn't find the exact value, but it's fine. It's gonna be just fine. There won't be any problem. It'll work without issue. Okay, the new cap is in and it's time just to test this thing out, see if it does anything hooked up to a monitor. The symptom I had when I first tested this, I do remember, is it felt like the power switch was broken and I wasn't getting any video at all out of the video out. I don't remember if the power LED was coming on. Maybe it was, I don't quite remember. This was several months ago that I did this testing. So let's see what we get. Oh, okay, so we are getting video. I don't know, maybe the LED was bad. Um, again, I never opened the computer obviously because we didn't even have the, um, the broken seal there. Let's try connecting up the cover here and see if we have a working LED. Oh, we do, it's green. Yeah, we can tell it's later. Commodore switched from red power LEDs to a green. Okay, a later, as in the manufacturer date of this thing. All right, so uh, RAM. Oh, yeah, okay. Ow, wow, that was hot. So, <laughs> yet another RAM, another bad RAM machine. What kind of RAM is this here? Texas Instruments. I don't understand how so much of the 4464 DRAM is bad. Let's see, okay, so this other chip was bad on another machine. I don't know what brand that is. It's got a little triangle on it. And then this chip right here was bad on the first machine. So we have Sharp, TI, and this. Now please be mindful that this memory here, this stuff right here is used on a lot of video cards, especially VGA cards and stuff like that. So if you have a VGA card that's got 4464 and it's not working and feel for hot RAM chips, maybe whatever the affliction is with these particular DRAM chips affects video cards as well. All righty, new RAM is in. Here are the old two chips. So I have the test harness connected, obviously. Let's plug in the diagnostic cartridge. I mean, I'm just thinking it's gonna work, right? Because it's kind of what's happened every time we've had bad RAM. All right, here we go. Oh, look at that, it came right up. It's just, I don't know, it's unbelievable to me that so much of this RAM is just bad. Three different brands as well, just, it seems weird to me. Uh, let's see, sound, I think it's gonna work. There it is. Another freaking perfectly working machine. Step four, turn that off, except for bad RAM. Oh, I don't know, this is just so strange. How could there be so much bad RAM? Let's just turn it on, get to the basic prompt. Yeah, there it is, looking good. That brings us to a total of six bad RAM chips, two bad 6526s, and of course, a bad capacitor. All righty, there we have it. All five of the 64Cs are repaired. Okay, well, a little clarification. I don't have a whole ton of extra 6526 CIA chips. So the two of these machines that had those bad chips currently just have an empty socket. But that means that to get those working, all that needs to be done is have that chip installed. But I do just wanna reiterate that three of those machines had bad RAM from three different manufacturers. I, it boggles my mind how that's possible, how the RAM is so flaky on these particular machines. And I've definitely fixed several other 64Cs in the past that had the same exact problem. So if you're gonna be buying a 64, I still do recommend the 64C 
as the more reliable machine. It's very likely that the thing is going to work with the caveat being the RAM. Just put your fingers on the RAM chips, see if they're feeling hot. If they are, well, that's a really good start. Just swap those out and in three of these machines, that got it working immediately. I have an idea about why I thought the power switch was bad on the most recent one I just fixed. I think when I tested it, I used like a really weak power supply. It wasn't my, my beefy three amp, five volt power supply I have on the bench here. And maybe those RAM chips that were getting super hot when I touched them, maybe they're so shorted that it actually killed the five volt rail, which kept the LED from even turning on or the machine seemingly to output no video at all. So not sure about that, but definitely that was all that was wrong with the computer. Oh, and that capacitor. Now, when I was reassembling it, I meant to film it, but I didn't. I was putting the shield back on the RF shield and the cap I installed fit really nicely through a cutout in the board so it wouldn't be knocked over. Well, definitely when I took that thing apart, that cap that had the leg ripped out of it was laying on its side under the RF shield. So it wasn't going through that hole or that slot in the shield. So I have a feeling that that cap was bad from day one when that machine was manufactured. And Commodore, obviously by that point in the 90s, maybe their quality assurance was really in the toilet, especially for the 64, which was becoming a very inexpensive computer by that point. So it's quite possible that it just was like that forever. And the machine probably worked fine for who knows how long, whoever used that computer. But then maybe the RAM took it out of service or maybe it was out of service and then the RAM died, who knows? So five machines, they were broken, now they're fixed. All in one video, definitely like a mini repair-a-thon, something I haven't done in a long time. If you enjoyed this video, thumbs up would be appreciated, but if you didn't, you know what to do. Hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. Also, I wanna thank my patrons, their names are scrolling up like one of the sides of the screens. Uh, they get early access to videos, behind the scenes stuff, things like that. And if you wanna become a patron, you can do so at the link in the description below. And I think that's gonna be it. So stay healthy, stay safe, and I will see you next time. Bye.